Hello and welcome to the Covenant of Mayors podcast. I'm Anthony Coakley. It's been an honour and a joy to host this series of episodes, sharing insights into how cities can adapt to the effects of climate change. From delving into data and geospatial mapping, to understanding the importance of justice in climate action, to discovering how a humble water barrel in your garden can fight flooding and drought. I hope you've enjoyed the journey as much as I have. The opportunity to discuss all these topics has come through the Covenant of Mayors, and specifically a programme within this European initiative that bears the unwieldy title Policy Support Facility. What that means is external experts visiting cities around Europe to help them think about how best to protect local people from the effects of climate change that they face or expect to face, from droughts and heat waves to flooding and storms. Today, for this final episode of the season, I'm joined by three people who have helped to deliver this policy support facility program. You'll hear them use the acronym PSF to cities within the Covenant of Mayors. They're also the shadowy hands that have been helping with this podcast in the background, selecting speakers, thinking up questions and narrative arcs, and generally helping me to sound smart. While this episode is a bit of a heart-to-heart, it's also a chance to think through the key insights and lessons that the policy support facility has delivered for each of us. We'll discuss great ideas from cities like Bologna and Navas de San Juan, Essential success factors, like including people and organisations with lots of different backgrounds in your planning processes, or keeping equitable outcomes in mind throughout policy design, and will even encounter a surprising connection between outer space exploration and local climate action. My guests today are Alison de Louise, Max Bienveld, and Luca Aurbau. Alison is an urban climate change adaptation specialist applying nearly 20 years of policy, partnership and programme management experience to support city resilience. My name's Alison DeLuise and I'm an urban adaptation specialist working at Climate Alliance and working with the Covenant of Bears on this policy support facility and excited to talk with all of you today about what we've learnt. Max is a systems engineer by training, and his role as a sustainable cities consultant has, over a decade, supported public authorities and companies to deal with climate resiliency challenges. Max, Max Beineveld, born and raised in, in the Netherlands and uh, working at Climate Alliance as a, a project, co- project coordinator and also a policy coordinator. One of the, the projects I'm coordinating together also with Luca and, and, and Alison is, of course, the, the policy support facility. And I've done so uh, very happily and enthusiastically over the past two years. Luca is an architect and a sustainable urban development practitioner. At the same time, he works as an expert in resilience and climate adaptation at ICLE Europe. Luca Bau from ICLE Europe, working there as an expert in resilience and adaptation, and uh, I've been co-leading in the past two years the policy support facility program at the Covenant of Mayors Europe. Also very excited about the discussion, looking forward. So Luca, do you feel like we're in a better place now than we were three years ago when the European Commission published its adaptation strategy urging cities and regions to take action in adapting, or are we still lingering uh, perhaps behind? Maybe let me say something at the beginning that the, really the publication of the EU adaptation strategy has marked a key moment for European sustainability and for the European resilient transformation. For sure, a lot has been done since its publication. Uh, resilience has become more and more a priority and has been made a priority in the political agendas at different levels, from the European level to the national, regional, and local levels. Uh, Importantly, the the strategy has recognized the local level as a bedrock of adaptation. So finally, mayors and technicians were put on the spot and they were given more attention. So also to make sure that their needs and challenges were heard and tackled, but overall that resources were provided to support the work. And I think this is really a key element and something we should recognize when when talking about the the adaptation strategy. Uh, More concretely, what, what happened is that 
the Covenant of Mayors has been the first to test a program, the policy support facility, that aimed to support local and regional governments to take climate action. So basically passing from uh, the process of planning to the real implementation of what had been planned. At the same time, Another important initiative was launched, that is the European Mission on, on Climate Adaptation. So with this, a lot of more resources were provided for research, development of tools, platforms, and also cascading funding has been launched for citizen regions. So basically, uh, to answer your question, yes, I think that local and regional governments and we have more capacities today than we had three years ago to really work and, and implement a resilient transformation in Europe. Still, of course, um, the coordination between the many existing initiatives on this topic and uh, as well as also a generalized awareness throughout Europe from north to south, from uh, west to east, can be done and developed better. But I know and I'm sure that this is a priority now at the European level and, and also for, for regional and, and local governments. And there are efforts in networks, uh, uh, European Commission, uh, uh, national authorities to really push for this process and make it happen as soon as possible. So when we talk about adaptation and becoming resilient, those are vague terms in themselves and many would even say buzzwords, although that's not what we want them to be, of course. So maybe, Alison, could you tell me what, what do we mean by those terms and, and what's the vision that we're really pushing for when we throw these words around? Great question. And I think I'd preface that with saying I think it's increasingly evident, it has been for some time, but last summer, summer of 23, really brought home to many Europeans what's meant by human-induced climate change. So we saw record high temperatures in many countries with previous maximums smashed. So it was the hottest year on record last year. We saw regions experiencing devastating droughts, wildfires wreaking havoc. Those images from Greece are still haunting. And we also saw these huge deluges of rain, flooding cities, destroying infrastructure, creating landslides and resulting in the loss of really precious lives. And so I think we can confidently say Europeans recognise that climate change is here now and is only going to result in more extreme weather down the line. So I think, you know, I guess building on, on what Luca said, the good news is that local authorities and, and regions are, are also responding. So we're seeing an acceleration in their efforts to understand these climate hazards that their communities are expecting to face and what this actually translates to in terms of exposures and vulnerabilities. And, and from this understanding, they're then assessing and selecting and implementing really appropriate climate adaptation actions to reduce this exposure, as well as increase individual and community capacity to respond and bounce back from those that are not manageable. So as an example, we're seeing significant interest and investment in creating greener spaces that then tap into nature's unique ability to deliver these ecosystem services such as temperature reduction and water management. And these nature-based solutions are increasingly being reinforced by uh, more traditional grey engineering solutions that we're more familiar with. Again, layering on that, that's been complemented then further by, by technologies such as smart sensors or early warning systems. And we're also then seeing at the same time effort going into raising awareness and behaviour change activities with the idea that empowering citizens to make good and informed decisions is important. But I did want to, your question was about sort of scenarios I and mean, what does a resilient uh, scenario look like? And I would want to make the point that citizens don't experience their cities in these sometimes um, isolated silos that city administration structures or budgets are organised around. So a citizen really seeks to live in an environment that's attractive, that's increasingly green, that's safe, has easy access to amenities and services embodies a sense of community and is thriving economically. So we're increasingly seeing resilient and adapted scenarios expanding to take into account these sort of broader concepts of sustainability. So more buzzwords, but given the interconnectedness of all of these concepts, it makes sense for cities to spend their relatively finite financial and human resources on investments that lead to multiple positive outcomes. But I do want to just mention one thing that 
we still see missing, I, I think is still missing in these resilience scenarios. I, I can confidently say based on interactions with cities that equity and justice considerations are being increasingly embedded within their adaptation planning and implementation. And I think there's really an authentic desire to do so. But I would still say there is significant work to be done here to really eliminate this disproportionate negative burden that climate change is placing on, on what we see are vulnerable communities. So the elderly, uh, lower income groups, people with disabilities and, and such. Here, I just want to give a quick plug for the Covenant of Mayors resource that we published in December. It provides a range of entry points for cities considering equity throughout the development and implementation of their sustainable climate action plans. So you can find that under the, the Covenant website resources section. But then just very finally, coming back to the question, I, I think that concerted effort still needs to be directed at what's called procedural justice, another buzzword. But this is really about ensuring that vulnerable groups are engaged in decision making related to adaptation planning and implementation. And it's, it's not easy to do. It's easy for me to talk about this on this podcast, but doing it requires significant resource implications, trying to involve all of these different stakeholders. But I think we are seeing that without this authentic engagement of vulnerable groups early on in planning processes, cities really risk implementing projects that exacerbate existing inequities rather than using adaptation investment as an opportunity to increasingly close the gap. One of my favourite episodes of the, of the podcast so far was actually episode two with uh, Alexander Popartin, who delved into this idea of just resilience a lot and I think sometimes when we look on the news and we see people protesting against climate action, we go, you know, what's, what's going on? Are these people completely mad? But actually delving into the issue, it's it's clear that they can be done in the wrong way and the right way, let's say. So, Max, to leap over to you, you've all been engaged in this for quite a while. Luca has said we're seeing progress. Well, what about you? When you're working with municipalities, do you have this kind of feeling of excitement that you're seeing change really happening or are you getting increasingly worried that we're not going to make it there's there's two sides of the of 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 the coin here of course with with all, all with all things related to to climate action i suppose and i think one of the things to start with the the negative note i feel that all the kind of the, the hazards Alison has been naming like sometimes i feel that you know we need disaster to happen before we realize how how worse things are and and i think that that is of course discouraging you know the floods in in northern europe which are still going on quite recently and of course the the, the drought and heat in, in in most of southern europe but even in northern europe as examples however there are also really these kind of especially working for the policy support facilities kind of little these these lights that light up in 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 the darkness and i think one of the things that is uh, it was a very sm a small example also working with with the municipalities who took part in the policy support facility that really kind of inspired me to to and 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 kind of really pushed and just pushed me to hope for better was the the, the municipality located in spain um i'm gonna look up the name and there, of course navas de san uh, in Spain and the reason that this this municipality really stood out was that adaptation was a way to kind of have two unconventional allies working together and I think in a place like Europe which is increasingly polarizing especially around the topics of, of climate change but also on, on, on a wide range of topics like migration say I feel that this is so powerful right and I, I'll just talk to you about what I, I was I, I meant by this is that we had a situation where there was extreme droughts of course this is we're talking about Spain in the summer and the city was thinking of, of looking at implementing adaptation measures within within its its city's limits. Navas de San Juan is not a very big town uh, so there's also a lot of agriculture surrounding it and they also wanted to inform, uh, involve the farmers of, of, of olives in the area. And while normally these, these farmers were very, very critical of environmental managers, because, for example, in moments of drought, the municipality would, would, have, would implement water quotas, and which sometimes could really affect their crop yields. Uh, so th th this is an example where there's a lot of skepticism from these farmers to be engaged. But when you see over the period of the policy port facility, this was part of the technical system, that we gave to cities, they really, by informing them of the benefits of these adaptive, adaptive and regenerative measures and really talking in their language, you kind of see that trust is built 
and that slowly they understand that there is a common benefit and a common purpose for them. And so they started looking into regenerative agricultural pilots to really improve the water management of their other growth plots. So for me, this this really is a crucial example in, in how adaptative measures can kind of solve bigger and wider solutions that we're having in Europe. And, and that really gives me a lot of hope. So I'm, 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 this is kind of that light that I was mentioning about. And I think it all starts to kind of also talk to kind of our main target group here, right? So the municipalities, who, the brave municipalities who are implementing these measures is, I think, with everything when we're talking about implementing adaptation measures, it really starts, about, starts with what do other people that we need to involve and we need to, need to involve everybody, what do they care about? So how can we speak their language? So we can all kind of contribute to this transition uh, because we need, well, we all need to. And that really builds on what Alison was saying about unleashing co-benefits and really making sure that people are on, on board from the start. Because as you say, Max, uh, it's with those people that change really happens. I'd like to circle back to you, Luca, just thinking now about what Alison and Max have said. You were speaking about this change in, ad- in adaptation, moving from EU to national to regional to, to local. But what I'm hearing from Max and, and Alison is that a lot of the real inspiration is, is rather moving in the opposite direction, that it's, it's the energy at the local level that goes up and inspires more policy and more support programs at the European level. The local level, as I mentioned also before, has been recognized and must be recognized as a bedrock of adaptation. So it's really the the level of implementation, of ownership, of action. And it's at this level where we can see really the change happen. So I really believe that uh, cooperation uh, in this sense can can be key in fostering a change between different stakeholders, understanding how the flows of funding can be managed and how the resources for really implementing an adaptation can be mainstreamed in in the in the needed actions. So definitely we need the European, the national, the regional and the local level all on board. But we need still to understand and recognize that it's the local level implementing and making this this change possible. Of course, in the, in the under the policy support facility, we have collected uh, so many case studies of of implementation. We have really seen implementation happening. Uh, it's been really great to see how cities and regions have been committed to to make this change happen and in particular i would like to highlight one story from my country from italy the city of bologna has taken part in the technical assistance program under the policy support facility and through this program they have received support from two experts in order to co-implement pilot project aiming at greening bus stops around the city the mobilization of of local stakeholders was incredible so they they managed to bring together politicians technical officials uh, from the municipality local experts representatives from nature based solution related projects that were already going on in the city but also representatives from mobility companies since we are talking about uh, bus stops and mobility at the same time, there was a bit of a, of a touchy moment because, as you may know, between May and June, the region of Emilia-Romagna was devastated by a flooding event. For those who don't know, Bologna is the capital city of the Emilia-Romagna region. As you can imagine, the priorities of the local and regional governments to change in order to also respond to the catastrophe and uh, mm, Consequently, uh, the budget that the municipalities wanted to allocate to the development of the uh, policy support facility uh, project were frozen. Nonetheless, the experts became available to adjust the, the support that they were giving to the city in order to provide a detailed and flexible planning for really implementing the, the project in the near future. So they still decided to visit the city a few weeks after the the flooding event 
and they were there to discuss with the technicians their needs, their challenges, and to really provide more tailored support. This is to say, basically, that uh, adaptation is never a linear pro process. There are so many shocks and we are in such a challenging period at the moment that we don't know what we can expect. So we need to have the flexibility and we need to have the will to adjust what we do. Uh, we need to incorporate this flexibility in all the programs that we write, in, uh, in all the actions we take. And I, I feel very proud that on the one side, the city remain committed to their objectives to really transform the city to make it greener. And at the same time that the experts were concerned for what was happening and uh, provided their assistance flexibly, keeping in mind that the, the main aim of, of their assistance, of course, were the needs of the city. And that goes back to what Alison said as well, both about overcoming these silos, but also about the sad fact that we're now sort of having to figure out how to do climate adaptation in the midst of, rather than in anticipation of disaster. So that's, that experience is probably going to be a good lesson going forward, sadly. And just before I move on, Luca, what is a green bus stop? I assume that's not green paint. No, of course not. Sorry for not explaining. So greening a bus stop means to include nature in the project and development of a structure of a bus stop. So including natural elements in this design, make sure that that specific place can, of course, absorb more water. And at the same time, also, we can not use gray materials, but rather green materials to make sure that we uh, create that space that where people can wait for the bus and and enjoy also that that side of the city. Great. Thanks, Luca. And so we heard a nice example from you just there and from you earlier, Max. Now, you've been doing this policy support facility for two years. So can you tell me a little bit about what you see as the keys to success in adaptation action for cities? Yeah, so there's there's so much to be to be named here, but I, let, let me just uh, name a couple of things that I think are that we've seen in the in the process of the policy support facility that that really kind of enhances or, or increases the, the 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 chances of success of adaptation actions to be implemented. And I think generally what you see is across the board of the policy support facility is that really. It's a two-way street. Adaptation incentivizes collaboration because, as we know, the climate change impacts and certain adaptation measures are so extended well beyond the, uh, the localities of, of municipalities and cities. So if you really see that within this process, we didn't, it was not obligated to, to collaborate with other municipalities and regional government, but the, the, the cities and the regions that did take part in the policy support facility kind of did them by themselves. So this is kind of a, a really a beautiful given is that you see across the board that municipalities and regions are really collaborating to to make sure that their local planning um, are are adapted to each, each other's needs and also are really collaborating to make change possible. So one of the, the examples we saw this was that the municipality of Cox, who is revitalizing a former mine quarry in, into a kind of a, a natural park, and they were collaborating directly with the region of, of Valencia. Uh, another really interesting example was the Roma Romanian municipality Verbinti Tark, who, who kind of reached out to their neighboring municipalities and say, hey, we are assessing all the environmental data. We're assessing our risks within the environment. Uh, what about we kind of combine our capacity? Because we, what you see is that these smaller municipalities are, are very, very limited in having this kind of expertise. Why don't we all get together and make sure that we improve our, the, the data that we have for, you know, for the reasons that we are located in? And then there, there, the final example also where really this collaboration went through adapting their cities to climate change happening was the, the region of Gabovo in Bulgaria, also an example from Eastern Europe, who kind of brought back together several municipalities within their region and to kind of build towards a shared adaptation strategy. So really kind of collaborating together with the municipalities and the re with the regions within your environment can really strengthen your adaptation impact. And then 
I think another really important thing that we've seen happening for, for effective and, and, and successful climate adaptation action is really including citizens and other stakeholders in the process. So I already named the example of the of the farmers, right, within the city of Navas de San Juan, but also the municipality of Debrechen did something very, very interesting. Like it, it's also the small things that really matter. They, they were dealing with a, a lot of floods within the city during the the winter period and they were just started to giving out rain barrels to for citizens to collect a lot of water and also to collect that water for the periods of dryness within the summer period so in a way this was a very practical action against two types of climate hazards. One was the flooding and at the same time was tackling the droughts in the region. And at the same time, these actions kind of really raise the awareness and give you an, an entry point to kind of inform your citizens of the risk of climate change. So I really also really like this example. And 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 then there was also the community of Mazzo Ninos, Mazzo Mat Tosinos in Portugal. Sorry if I don't pronounce it properly with my uh, heavy Dutch accent. But they also were really, they are uh, revitalizing an old riverbed and at the same time started to communicate all the co-benefits of the, this renaturalization. So they saying they, they made their citizens aware of the local hazards. They 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 mentioned also that this, these actions would improve their biodiversity. So, th so really involving these stakeholders and these citizens really made for uh, 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 really increase the impact of your actions and also increase the the chances of your actions to being being successful and i think finally and i think to to, to add to this question so what do cities and regions need to to uh, to do to be successful is that i what we really saw as well because we had a lot of municipalities participate also a lot of smaller municipalities participate is that we saw that although, yes, municipalities are extremely low on capacity to implement environmental measures, this is what we see, and this is still something, an issue that we, we need to make sure that the European Union is hearing as a national governance as well. But we also need also not need uh, to underestimate how much smaller municipalities can do. So I think it's like one, one individual, this, for example, was in the municipality of Cox, can make such a difference. If you have a motivated person within these municipalities to really go the extra mile and to, to, to just start acting. You see that a lot of change can happen in a, in a very small period, even in a year, the duration of the technical assistance. So these are just a couple of things that I felt are important to mention in, the, in this process that we went through. That echoes a little bit what people were pointing to, the importance of collaboration, multi-level, horizontal, and of course, with the, with the local people as being really key. And I'd like to point listeners to uh, episodes seven and eight to hear those great stories from the Brets and, and, and Cox as well. So we have the, the sort of key ingredients, but we know that, and you know, certainly from your experience, that cities are so many different points when it comes to adaptation. Some are very progressed. Some are really just starting to think about how to how to put it into action. Some under circumstances of great duress, uh, Luca, as you pointed out, and some still still ahead of the change, say locally. Alice, what advice or input would you give for cities that are trying to think about how to start off on this path or or how to progress from maybe the initial steps they've taken? Yeah, thanks, Anthony. And it's a great question because I, I think you know, you made the the point perfectly that not all cities and regions are at the same stage regarding their adaptation planning. So you know, it'd be all it'd be great to all be Barcelona's and Paris's, but but that's not the reality. So for for those many places that are just beginning their res resilience journeys, I guess I'd call it, they really need to start with this this assessment, sort of informed by data of, of what their unique situation is, and looking at the climate projections of their territory. It, it's it's not really a cut and paste exercise because it's so contextual. So if if it's okay, Anthony, I'm going to do another plug. Thank you. I'd like to plug the Urban Adaptation Support Tool, which was developed by the Covenant of Mayors and the European Environment Agency, and also a complementary regional adaptation support tool that's just been developed under the EU Mission on Adaptation. And so these tools are really user-friendly step-by-step guides that help local authorities move through the sort of adaptation planning, implementation, and monitoring process. So one thing, and again, Max said it very clearly, it's come out already throughout this conversation, critical early step is working with stakeholders to understand what the most critical local risks are, 
who's going to be most exposed to them and what that means for most vulnerable communities. Sorry to keep harping on about that, but, you know, really, really critical. So then out of this analysis, you know, the, the, the local authorities can then select the most appropriate and cost effective different actions. So so those tools, again, hopefully Anthony might be able to put a, a link also in, in the transcript for, for those resources. But I think uh, more generally for those just starting out, but also for those that have well established policies and plans, we need to acknowledge that the challenges Europe's going to face in the future are likely actually are guaranteed to include much more extreme events that are going to actually require much more transformational actions. So yes, we've got to do the small things, the low hanging fruit, all really critical, but we also need to be thinking pretty big and pretty ambitiously. And because we know that resources are limited, again, another theme of the podcast, cities and regions are going to need to think as holistically and as cross-sectorally as possible. So they really need to think about how do they maximise their investments by choosing these adaptation measures that are going to address multiple challenges. So again, going back to nature-based solutions, it's always a great example. It is not the only solution. And again, stressing that nature-based solutions should also be combined with more traditional grey infrastructure solutions. But, you know, we, we need to sort of think about a green space is not just providing these ecosystem service benefits I mentioned earlier, heat, water management, but they also provide space for communities to gather, for social cohesion to be built, for people to exercise, um, also then mental well-being, for more isolated community members to be integrated, for biodiversity to thrive. So, so the scale of this transformation required to deal with these future predictions is going to really require us to to rethink completely what our cities of the future are going to look like. And I think we can all agree that 20th century urban planning models are not going to be so relevant under these future scenarios. So I know that's sort of ambitious, but but then the next question is, well, how are we going to pay for it? So it's going to require a lot of money. And yet we're seeing lots of pools of funding available at the EU level to support regions and cities. But the reality is it's really a drop in the ocean compared to what's going to be needed. So we're going to need to be looking at new innovative financial mechanisms, including things like environmental impact bonds or climate resilience bonds, that they'll need to be developed though in ways that even those municipalities with limited technical capacities can somehow access them. So again, Max spoke about pooled up efforts of municipalities getting together, we're going to need to think about this also for financial mechanisms. We're going to need to think about how venture capital, which has traditionally really flown mainly to mitigation projects, how can that increasingly find opportunities within this adaptation field? We're, we need, need to be thinking about public-private partnerships and how they'll need to be formed to support all this. And what are the new market mechanisms that will incentivize certain behaviours and investments, including, I should say, behaviours and investments of individuals and households. So empowering to the lowest level to also be involved. So all levels of government, from EU to national to regional through to local level, are going to need to be involved. It's a big ask, but I think Everyone's on this journey together. So the more that we can be sharing experiences and lessons learned, the, the more that we're going to all move in the same direction at the pace that's required. It's such a complex balancing act, I think, as well. You know, I think you mentioned two sort of supposed binaries, you know, grey versus green infrastructure, adaptation versus mitigation, and 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 the importance of, I think, latching on to co-benefits and making those two things sort of work in each other's favor. Um, I forgot to pull you up earlier, so maybe you could just take a second to define what you mean by grey infrastructure, that sort of flood yeah. walls and things like that, right? And, yeah, and maybe it's... as you're doing so, you could just tell us a little bit about how cities could think about, as you said, people, that kind of a lot of us are stuck in the old model. How can we think about balancing that green and grey infrastructure? Yeah, sure. And I think, you know, I, I'm a fan of moving away from binaries as well. I think we need all solutions on the table. And so let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, let's get rid of grey. And by grey, I mean, it's what we're used to when we think about traditional sort of urban infrastructure. It's big pipes that take water away from cities to treatment plants. It's it's uh, big levees and dikes that stop water from coming over the edges of, of rivers or, or, or oceans. It, it's It's that sort of engineered hard infrastructure and again that is actually a critical underpinning for a lot of what our cities 
currently rely on. And so, so we're not saying that grey equals evil. What we're saying, though, is let's tap in to the incredible services that, that nature offers us and combine and bring those things together. So we may still decide that we need to have some sort of levy, but let's make that levy extra efficient and also provide all these other co-benefits by introducing lots of green landscaping to that site. Or again, we talk about the green infrastructure in cities, we might have a bioretention pit. So a pit that basically water runs, excess water in a big storm runs off the, the grey concrete and tarmac and roads into these these sort of tree pits. And so obviously it's able to, the, the tree and the tree pit is able to retain and store that water until the flooding subsides, that the tree is able to thrive with that water. But that also does require some grey infrastructure. It requires some engineering within that tree pit. So so, so even green infrastructure generally requires some engineering solutions, but it's really just about moving much more towards green being the default and working out how grey can support that than, than what was in the past, which was, was all about grey. Thanks a lot, Alison. Really clear. In part one of this episode, one thing that I think has really shone through is a current that's run under this whole podcast how cities are combating climate change's impacts by blending nature-based and traditional solutions, moving forward in a collaborative and inclusive spirit that moves towards adaptation in step with community empowerment. In part two, we'll go deeper into the collaborative framework that underpins successful adaptation strategies. We'll explore the importance of peer-to-peer exchanges and the invaluable lessons that cities and regions can learn from one another. My guests will also flag enduring challenges like funding, capacity and time and other current and future opportunities for cities looking to beef up their climate resilience. We'll also take a brief trip to outer space before a soppy party. So, Luca, we've heard from Max and from Alison about the importance of cooperation and one of the forms that Max mentioned was this horizontal so peer-to-peer among cities. Uh, How important is this element among all the other elements and what can cities in Europe learn from the experiences of those that were involved in the policy support facility? We we have heard a lot even in this episode of the podcast that cities are taking action so adaptation and resilience action is happening around europe i mentioned already also that so many initiatives are active and alison and max have added more so our continent is in this moment experiencing a lot of research and innovation. And we need to recognize that cities and regions are the places for research, test and innovation of of solutions in in disaster risk management, uh, in uh, adaptation, in resilience in general. I'm sure we cannot miss the opportunity to capitalize on the knowledge they have and 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 make the most of it, out of it this means that we need to really understand that cities and regions hold the knowledge that can accelerate the action in other places and foster replication so peer to peer exchanges aiming to apply and replicate solutions already experimented is the only option we have to make the transformation up when happen quickly and broadly At the same time, we as city networks, uh, sustainability and climate change practitioners, experts, etc., we have the duty to support and facilitate this process, overall providing spaces uh, to make this happen. Often cities and regions do not find these spaces, do not have the time and opportunities to make this exchange happen. We need to recognize how peer-to-peer exchange is important, how can these foster replication and accelerate the adaptation of our continent. More concretely, under the policy support facility, we organize different activities to, to make sure that participants could learn from each other. Starting from the national workshops, where basically we aim at making people discuss about their country-specific climate change issues and learn from each other about already tested ways to solve them, to also the peer learning program, 
where smaller municipalities are facing similar issues and opportunities uh, the opportunity to visit each other and see firsthand the solutions applied around Europe to increase urban uh, resilience. So basically, learning from these experiences and also from the highly positive feedback that we have received from those who participated in these activities, I think we need to stress that cities and regions must share their knowledge, the knowledge they have, must be proud of what they do and curious also of what they're doing. Um, we need to give, put the cities and the regions on the spotlight and, and, and really listen to what they have to say, what they learned and what challenges they, they encounter when implementing certain actions. Uh, most of the, of the issues that cities are, are facing now were already addressed by, by others. So um, they, they really need to, to push international agents, networks, experts to create those spaces I, I mentioned before and make sure that peer-to-peer -peer exchange is facilitated and possible. Generally been speaking in, in an optimistic tenor, despite being realistic too, a couple of challenges have come up specifically in relation to this idea of peer exchange. So funding capacity has been mentioned already and time you just mentioned as well, Luca, as, a, as an issue. Um, Max, can you tell me a little bit about how cities can overcome the challenges that might stop them from finding these network solutions? Yeah, yeah that, that, I think that's a hard question, like how to solve those the challenges that you mentioned, time and capacity. I think that th those are, of course, hard. But I think generally, I think when when we're talking about facilitation or cities looking for these types of peer changings, peer to peer exchanges, I think it's really crucial. And and also as Alison mentioned, is that to really look for peers that are facing similar challenges as yourselves, right? This seems very obvious, but like a lot of these climate hazards are extremely contextualized. So I think it's 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 important for cities looking for these experiences, but also for people who are facilitating these types of experience, which happens in many European projects, is to really take into account, okay, how what climate hazards are affecting these cities what type of other cities with a very similar size with very similar challenges are dealing with these hazards in, in an innovative hopefully innovative manner or, or effective manner so i think sometimes we look over these things and then this affects the success of these exchanges i think it's also very for not only mentioning kind of the challenges that cities will have to make to sure that these spiritual changes are uh, effective. So similar city size could help. Um, I think it's also very in, in necessary that, that their willingness to collaborate long term, like I've experienced this peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, which of course are short term, just a couple of visits to each other. But I, I also see that long-term collaborations of course bear more fruits because they you can more go more in depth so i think what i would i would definitely vouch for longer longer peer to peer exchanges among among municipalities and cities and i think it's also very crucial that cities when they're talking to each other really re leave a lot of room for open discussions because a lot of these things side visits they really tend to planned a lot of things, visits and presentations, which are extremely inspirational. But I think it's also crucial that they leave a kind of a bit of their, their a tendency to control everything kind of open-ended and really talk to each other and say like, hey, what, what challenges are you facing with stakeholder engagement, with citizen engagement, with collaboration, multi-level governments? So really have that time to talk to each other. And I think it's always crucial when you're thinking about replicating these kind of activities by peer to peers is that you really take into account also your contextual, your, your actual localized context, right? So yes, you could have cities who have who face the same threats, but governments, regulations, mandates of, of municipalities can defer extremely. So it's always good to make sure that these contexts are, are taken into account. And I think finally, my final comment would be is that when you make, when you're taking part in these peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, make sure that you, as many as possible, you invite at maybe at one of the, the final meetings when you're presenting kind of the learnings that you've learned across uh, during this peer-to-peer -peer exchange to include stakeholders, stakeholders from different departments, right? This kind of touches uh, again on this working across silos. So people are aware. And so the moment you start working on it at your city yourself, people already kind of 
taking with or being traveled with you on that process and which will most probably also ensure that 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 the actions you can take w within a bureaucratic environment will be implemented faster so may i add right. on this because max mentioned that uh, we have experienced very short collaboration and this is very true this was a, a short program and we couldn't have very long experiences of peer-to-peer -peer exchange between cities but it's also true as he said that this was the first step to then foster long-term collaboration between cities and we have seen this in specific cases where this collaboration in the peer learning program was just the first step for them to start a collaboration between the two cities and applying, for example, for uh, European funding together. So small municipalities can really, really build on each other and cooperate to have more opportunities also for funding and, and for implementing adaptation at a bigger scale. Alison, you, you've seen some examples of this cooperation functioning on the ground. Uh, I'd love it if you could share a more concrete idea of successful working together for cities. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I'm going to focus on the national workshops, which um, Luca introduced a few minutes ago. It was one of the components of the, the PSF and, and I was fortunate enough to lead it. So attend quite a few of the workshops. And we, we conducted them in 12 different countries across Europe, each in, in national language, really focusing on, on sort of national context with obviously local authorities as, as the central target audience. And I was incredibly impressed by the enthusiastic participation of, of participants. Now, they were a national language. So as I said, I don't speak 12 different languages. And so it was clear to me that whilst I couldn't understand always the, the actual topic that was being discussed, that that hunger for knowledge was, was it very evident. It was also recognition, I think, that that success, successful adaptation efforts probably would only be successful through this collaboration of peer municipalities but also with technical experts, with other levels of government and with networks such as Covenant of Mayors. So again, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. I know we keep harping on about it, but it's so central. So this sort of reassured us. We decided to run these workshops as face-to-face -face events. And of course, that always comes with trade-offs. You know, there's carbon implications. There's You have more limited number of people able to attend. There's travel costs. Um, but we did it this way in national language with local authorities at the centre because we really wanted to, to ensure that municipalities coming together could, I guess, we're, we're working off a similar basis, contextual basis in terms of um, national um, policies, politics, all the rest of it. But we did also involve other critical stakeholders the other thing we tried to do, and Max also mentioned it, whilst these were fairly heavily programmed, we also provided ample time for informal networking on the sidelines, and we ensured that we had these sort of practical activities to support um, the networking so that when, when people were working together, it also started to build the first elements of trust and relationships, hopefully the, the seeds of future collaborations. So, for example, in our workshop in Slovenia, which we did in Ljubljana, we had a number of municipalities volunteer to present one of their in development adaptation projects to all of the other municipalities present there and did an exercise where people moved around tables to get additional inputs and feedback on, on what they were working on. And it was super successful because we saw new ideas coming in. We saw almost like literal you know, globes switching on in people's heads about, but I could do that in my municipality. And, and again, not that I understand Slovenian, but they speak incredibly good English. And many reported back to me that there were lots of ideas they were planning to borrow from those conversations when they went back to their own municipalities. So another example was the value of having national adaptation experts as well as representatives of national government at these workshops. And their role wasn't just to impart information, but again, it was this idea of using these workshops to get them to start establishing connections and relationships that would be useful to them in the future. So we intentionally sought representation from different level of governments, but also from research and practitioner communities to try and build a, a kind of strong national ecosystem, multi-level governments adaptation system to, to really ensure, I guess, future sustainability of adaptation efforts within national contexts. We, we know national governments play a really critical role in empowering local action, and they're best placed to provide critical financial and technical capacity, but they also have to listen and understand what local challenges are, and these workshops provided a, a great forum for that. 
The, the final example I want to give is of a concrete collaboration that emerged out of the Italian National Workshop in Rome, and it came out of the result of the presence of a representative from the European Space Agency. So, so um, this this lady attended, and they had been uh, the agency has been mandated by their board to develop a really comprehensive program to look at how space services and technologies can be used and in the future even designed to support greener, more sustainable and adapted cities. So not just technology as space for going out there and exploring, but using that to support life on Earth in a sense. So a very fruitful sideline conversation between this person and, and I guess myself who was at this workshop, it's now evolved in that we now, the Covenant of Mayors, are an inaugural partner in this new accelerator program that the Space Agency is co-developing with the idea being to increase European local local authority access. So all of these cities, municipalities, their access to space services and data to help with their adaptation and mitigation planning and execution. So they can access this incredible wealth of data to help them make good decisions. And we see really huge potential here, particularly for those less resourced municipalities and cities or regions that don't have the finances to access or develop their own databases. So now we're, we're sort of acting as an entry point and a facilitator to connect your European space technology to local municipalities across Europe for adapted cities. And that was just an example of another collaboration that came out of the workshop. I think when we talk about sharing knowledge and collaboration, maybe we don't always think about the sort of kinesthetic element of that learning, the physical element and how much you open up to someone just by leaning over the same table. Versus, for example, I mean, I think that we're connecting very well online right now, but uh... it's true. And, and we also know adults learn by doing, not by just sitting and listening. So get them hands on practicing, doing things, pencils and paper and writing. And it's amazing the energy you'll find in a room. It's great over this conversation how we've managed to draw a line all the way from the most local level to outer space <laughs> from start to end. It's been really interesting gathering so many insights from what's been such an involved and I think a fruitful policy support facility from the Covenant of Mayors over the last years. I'd love to hear a little bit more now about um, the future. So Luca, the, the facility is closing quite soon. Is there anything still in the works before it does so? Yes, it's true that the program is about to finish, but we still need to publish a final report with all the learnings from the from this initiative and inspiring stories from from cities and regions that participated in this. We are aiming just to give a spoiler to to have a very handsome and interactive document with links to relevant information, case studies from the program. So basically just stay tuned. Follow the Covenant of Mayors Europe webpage and uh, yeah, this will come very soon. Depending on how long I take to put this podcast together, maybe it's already on the shelf. <laughs> Let's, um, what about you, Max? So all of the valuable things that have been learned from the program, not just by the cities, but also by the experts and others that participated. Um, anything that you think could make future EU initiatives even better and, and more impactful that you gathered through this experience? Yeah, thanks, Anthony. I think that's a really, really important question. So I'll try to, to keep it short. And I think I want to re-echo also again what, what, what Alison's already really talked about within the beginning of the podcast. Like I think within the program, the, the, the next European projects and tenders and on adaptation, I think we need to really see adaptation as a goal in itself. But at the same time, we really need to see it as a means to an end. Like adaptation, like because it's going to make it so much easier to communicate, right? Because in the end, adaptation should would really should be about improving the life of European cities uh, cities and therefore its citizens right small or big so in the end adaptation solutions can clean our soul airs and improve the aesthetics of our surroundings even incentivize as Alison was saying a healthier lifestyle and even Im Im improve the relationships we as citizens have with nature surrounding us right so 
Yeah, and then last but not least, a function as a vessel to communicate kind of this bigger picture of taking care of our shared shared environment and, and to put it in uh, quite creative terms, the spaceship Mother Earth, right? So I think that is a very crucial aspect that I want to uh, to, to, to reiterate. And, and then some more kind of policy and, and, and technical advice. I think the, the EU really needs to keep on facilitating a local approach to adaptation, right? We, like they really need to also push like the EU is doing with the natural national energy and climate plans which barely includes adaptation practices that they really push national governments right to incorporate the local adaptation needs and priorities in the natural adaptation strategies right this is extremely crucial so and this could be done through regulatory means but also fiscal and policy decisions and then finally i think really programs and the eu therefore really need to keep on providing a technical capacity support Support to these local authorities because they just really need it. And you see also through the policy support facility how beneficial this technical system was. They need to prioritize certain technical systems because I think it's not a cure for all. It's not a panacea. It's not a medicine for all. But I really do think that we need to keep on uh, del uh, delivering technical support when it, when we're talking about local adaptation, uh, planning and implementation, but also regarding climate risk assessments. We need to keep on doing this and, of course, support these innovative pilots that Luca also was talking about, that then these innovative pilots can be again scaled to other cities like they're doing in the the smart climate neutral smart climate neutral cities missions i think it would be great that this that this will also be done on on an adaptation measures a final question to you alison then because max mentioned that there's a, a real need for more programs like this and i think that everyone who's involved would, would agree with that but it's also the case that there are an existing suite of and an ongoing suite of other opportunities for cities in in the interim i wonder if you could shed some insight on that yeah, for sure. And you know, whilst the policy support facility pilot is ending, it sits within the Covenant of Mayors Europe and we are not going anywhere. So just to stress that the Covenant continue to really centre adaptation work within this initiative. It's, it's one of the three central pillars of the program. So we will continue to produce tools and peer learning opportunities and information campaigns, technical assistance opportunities. So stay tuned there. But Beyond the, the Covenant of Mayors, the EU's Mission on Adaptation is, is a great resource where not only do the 300 plus charter signatories to the mission benefit from, from funding and technical assistance and peer learning, but many of those offerings are also accessible to all of the rest of Europe's region and local authorities. So a lot of the mission related horizon and life grant calls are open to all authorities uh, and many of the resources developed under the mission are also available to non-charter signatories. So I recommend, again, I feel like I'm just doing lots of plugging here, but these resources are important. So check out the website of the mission impl implementation platform, so MIP for ADAPT and explore what they've got there. I also at the EU level want to direct listeners to the Climate Adapt website. It's kind of the repository of all things climate change adaptation in Europe, and it's curated and managed by the European Environment Agency. And I really see it as a treasure trove of resources. So lots of case studies, data dashboards, policy documents, and the like. So again, go and check out Climate Adapt. But I want to, I guess, re-emphasize that yes, EU really important, but national and regional governments and member states are, are actually really critical and, and needing to step up and are stepping up to provide support to their jurisdictions. So this is sometimes we're seeing in the forms of grants, technical assistance or policy. And we're seeing, for example, some great regional examples in countries like Italy and Spain, for example, the regions of Galicia, Sicily, Emilia-Romagna and Apulia, where they're actually establishing dedicated offices to support, in this case, Covenant for Mayor Signatories, but beyond with their sustainable energy and climate action plans. So we're really excited, actually, and are really doing our best to support this national level creation of resources and support, because we think that's where really sort of the, the, the bulk of effort needs to, to take place. So lots of things out there, lots of opportunities, and we look forward to continuing to engage with, with Europe's municipal authorities on, on climate adaptation in the future. So lots of opportunities out there and lots also in, in a germination phase at the moment to lots of cities to do and, and to look forward to. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to thank you all for joining me today and especially for helping 
well, with this podcast, creating such great material, engaging with the cities and giving speakers throughout the whole season a lot to talk about with me up until now. So great to speak and to have your voice as well. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank yeah, you. and thank you, Anthony. I, I really enjoyed listening to your extremely charming hosting of these all these podcasts. So, uh, like, I don't know, we we did we did collaborate a lot in, during on the emails, but I, like, I kind of I really loved checking in every now and then and hearing you talk to all these like municipalities and experts. So, thank you so much as well for your help and for for creating a, a like all these wonderful podcasts. So, thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, we were quite daring with the hour format, but I think we made it. Uh, yeah, we, made it, we, made it <laughs> we were. We were. I think we made it work. So uh, thanks a lot. I was wondering if we should reveal that Luca was writing the questions for this episode. So I was thinking every time you're saying, oh, that's a good question. Uh, that's an interesting <laughs> question. Luca should be taking a little bow. <laughs> <laughs> well, well it's, the, it's, the, it's the delivery of the questions that's equally as important, Anthony. And you deliver those <laughs> questions with that, that lovely Irish lilt. So it's certainly uh, helpful. It's always charming to hear. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Alison. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I wish you guys a wonderful week and hope that we'll be in, in touch again soon. Thanks. All right. Thanks Thank you all. Great. Bye. Thanks for joining us for this final episode of the Covenant of Mayors podcast. Remember, you can find all the episodes of this season, plus transcripts and useful links at eu mayorseceuropaeu It's been great having you along for the ride.